Welcome back to the Trade Hacker Mindset Podcast. We have a special episode today with all three founders of Option Omega. Trading the markets can be difficult to master and seemingly just out of reach. Professional traders have a secret. Trading requires total mental and emotional control. It requires the Trade Hacker Mindset. All right, welcome back, guys. Uh, look for I've been looking forward to this episode. I have all three founders of Option Omega with me here, and the the idea here for me that I want to cover, and this could go a lot of different ways, but I want to jump into kind of the origin of Option Omega. Uh, this isn't going to be something where we're going to be talking about a lot of feature requests. I know these guys get bombarded with those on a daily basis, so we'll <laughs> leave that for the Discord. But I really want to jump into the kind of the origin of Option Omega, how it came to be what it is today, maybe a little bit about what's next with Option Omega. And I, I want to jump into a little bit about your each of your backstories of how you got started with your trading journey and all of that good stuff. So to start with, we've got Rusty, we've got Matt, and we've got Troy. I've, I've done a couple of joint webinars for our community with Troy, so I kind of have interacted with him the most. I've been, done some interaction with, with Matt uh, just via chat in our Discord, and I've had very little interaction with, with Rusty, so look forward to hearing more about, more about Rusty and his journey. So with that, let, let's, just, let's start with the, with the story of Option Omega. How did this whole thing come about? And any of you can jump in, go ahead. I think Rusty's Rusty's the perfect starter for that. So, a lot of good things are born through pain and suffering. I feel like, and uh, <laughs> Option Omega is no different. The the genesis of that would be Troy and I were trading options at the time. I guess we'll talk about more of that later. But there was a couple of trades that we had back tested on a different product, and they did exceedingly well. These were extremely short term trades like too good to be true well. And so we traded them for a bit and they did really well um, until they did not. And then we had some pretty massive drawdowns. <laughs> and so, and we looked like, well, this is completely out of bounds of the back test of this and that. And, and we kept poking and digging. And I, I can't remember who found it. We were like, wait a minute, this back test only has end of day data. And when you're doing like one DTE option strategies, end of day data only is probably not good enough. It's going to hide some pretty massive drawdowns overnight, things like that. And so after we finished licking our wounds, um, we started talking like, surely we can just develop something for ourselves uh, that can vet these kind of strategies in the future and hopefully save us a boatload of money. And so at the very beginning, it really was just a pet project between Troy and I, both being developers. Um, where we downloaded the data and just started messing around with it and iterating on it. It was like a little command line utility at first, right? It was rarely, there was no front end, there was nothing. And so sure enough, I ran that strategy. It was like a, I think it was like a 35 Delta 1DTE overnight condor or something with like no stop block or something ridiculous, right? It, it just, it just, it was terrible at the time. Anyway, um, and so sure enough, I ran it through this little program. I was like, oh, yeah, there, there's the uh, drawdowns. <laughs> there are the losses that we didn't see in the end of day only uh, data back tester. And so that was that was sort of the beginning of Option Omega. And then and, and Rusty, on, on not okay. to cut you off, but on that topic of, of you know, getting the data, I mean, uh, I mean, do you guys have multiple sources of data? Do you get it from an exchange or where does where does this uh, one minute data feed come from? So uh, we have multiple sources for the different components. Um, the options component comes from an Oprah data vendor, right? So, I mean, Oprah is really the one that does all the data for everybody, which is pretty crazy when you think about that single source. Um, so that's who we get our data from. And we've poked around and we've looked at different providers that are on that Oprah vendor list, and they're all pretty similar, honestly. Gotcha. Cool. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. I know you're good. No, no. So all that said, I, I think we just started thinking to ourselves, man, I, I think people might like this software. Like if we actually made it into, you know, a SaaS product that people could just quickly and easily use and 
And that's where kind of Matt came in the picture. I mean, it's not the exact timeline, but his background being in business and he and I going back to our college days, um, three of us started talking about forming a business and getting the software out there and seeing what kind of interest there was. Because we had no, we honestly had no idea, right? You, you just never know. Uh, so you sort of take a leap of faith and, and, and put the thing out there. And if it succeeds, great. If it doesn't, on to the next thing. So that was that was the beginning of it. Cool. And so what? And and so you guys just started kind of doing your own back testing, just started, and, and so what was the what was the first point where you actually rolled it out for others to use? We had worked on it for a while, and it and it coincided with the the company that Rusty and I were working for. There was an acquisition, and it got bought out, and so it was one of those fortuitous times in life where we're kind of sitting here saying, you know, we. Rusty and I really valued working together. Devs, we developed a really deep friendship. And so dev work was a really joyful time together and all those things, and we really wanted to keep going. And so rather than just try to go get another job, we said, well, let's just take a stab at this. And it coincided right around the time. You guys have to correct me. I can't remember all the dates at this point. But basically, like, 2021, I think we really got pretty serious about it and started talking through it and um, testing it internally. And then we launched officially in March of 2022. Um, and that's where Matt is a genius. That's the joy of like working with these guys is I'm by far the dumbest of the three. And that's precisely like where I want to be in my role is I would love to be the dumbest of them. You're the, face guy. Sure. You're the face guy though. It's the, but I'm the face guy and that's <laughs> a double whammy for them because it's certainly not the prettiest face either. So I am, um, but Matt was great because Matt was able to come in and, and he had run a business. He's, he's, he's a businessman. And so he can talk more about that, but he just had a wealth of experience that Rusty and I did not have being kind of developers. And so he was able to help us particularly in that like last half of 2021 and then the beginning of 2022 with launch say, all right, what does it mean to actually like own a SaaS business and go from there? So Matt, tell tell us about that. So you you hook up with these two computer nerds that think they've got something cool, and and you say, oh yeah, we may have a business idea here. How how does that go? Yeah. So I had a history with Rusty that goes back twenty years. We went to college together, so I've been in touch with Rusty. We were roommates. I mean, well, our families have been close for two decades now, and um, yeah, it was twenty twenty one. I came down and met Troy and. Uh, the more I'm the only non-developer, so they're both devs. And so the more they worked on it, it's like, guys, this is, if we find value in this, other people are going to find value in it as well. And I had a background in, um, options, but nothing like we do in options Omega. I, I, I had, I had started trading full time basically in 2020, like, the best slash worst time ever to start trading full time, January of 2020. Right. So, like two months before COVID, um, I started trading full time, and um, I had quit a previous job and put a little bit of money aside, and I was like, I'm just gonna use this set bucket and see if I can make a go, which I think is how a lot of people kind of do it. Mm -hmm. And I kept it separate from retirement, you know. There were YOLOs involved, but no risky YOLOs. They were managed YOLOs, right? Mm -hmm. And so I saw the power of options super early in COVID at the time with spy puts, you know? And I remember, I can remember I had, Boeing was in like the 300s. And I, I don't know what Boeing's at today, but it got down around 100, right? And I remember I had like 310 Boeing puts. And I, I remember I did the math and I was like, man, if I had moved the strike back like two months on those puts, that would have been a significant, you know, that would have been a hundred X options play. So I've been playing with options for an, a couple years. Um, but the, the style of trading that is really, really helpful for back testing, which is doing index options. I'm, I'm actually newer than both the guys at. So, um, I, I, some of the more advanced trade setups and styles, I'm still uh, getting my my feet wet on iron ducks and um, you know some some of the more advanced strategies. Um, I'm still learning, which is awesome. Um, 
and it's just been a great it's been a great ride i think one of the really kind of interesting big stories going on is that as a retail person who's not an institution we have access to great tools now and tools that just you if you talk to people who have been trading 10 or 15 years ago they just they would have loved to have access to the things we have now starting with you know brokers that you can trade on your phone and trade after hours in bed and you know all these things but uh, the, the visualization, the visualization, the testing, um, and some of these other kind of peripheral things really, really have helped empower just normal people who understand kind of how powerful options can be if you, if you learn it. So, yeah. yeah and, and I, I agree, you know, and, and, you know, not only the technology, but the commissions are reduced now, you know, it always makes me laugh when, when people complain about a 50 cent per contract commission, when, you know, just not too long ago, it was a couple bucks per contract. And, you know, it's, you know, so the things have changed in technology. And I mean, I, I've looked at a variety of institutional type trading platforms. And to be honest, the retail space has better technology in a lot of cases and more, yeah. you know, you can be more nimble. You have a lot more tools, a lot more access to things. And, and so, yeah, I agree a hundred percent. That's a, it's, it's a pretty amazing time to be a trader these days. So what I want to do now is, so any, anything else, anybody else wants to add about option Omega and kind of the, the start of jumping in? Uh, I'll give you a shout out. We were just talking about this the other day. Matt came down to Knoxville where we, Rusty and I are, and we had a little uh, business little re retreat slash meeting. Uh, and so we um, we were talking about just some stuff, and uh, I was reminded, I think Rusty reminded me, at the office, I kind of jumped into options first uh, via a weird route with like Nassim Taleb, but like I would, on the whiteboard, we would talk options, you know, during lunch break, we would get on the board and just start doing stuff. But I remember to this day, because every option trader has to learn patience and it's an ongoing thing and discipline and all of those things with options trading. But I, you, and I've said this before, you are an OG in this space. And so I uh, subscribed uh, to your classes and you really taught me a ton about options. And I remember you had an, I'll never forget it. You had a McDonald's, call long call spread like just on mcdonald's i had never traded mcdonald's and that sucker just set it was like a 60-day option or something crazy spread and it just sat there and it didn't do do anything and i was i did all the things that all the retail traders do where i was just like uh they don't know he doesn't know this one uh blah 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 blah, blah. and like sure enough like 20 30 days in it just like banked and uh i remember like oh this is my discipline thing because <laughs> Even to this day, I don't know if I would have done it. So just shout out to like, you were very good just to do it always, but discipline, patience, that's options, you know? Yeah. That's cool. Well, I, I appreciate that. That's, uh, it's cool to see, you know, we, so navigation trading started in 2016 and it's just, it's so cool to see the cycle now of people, you know, maybe who are just starting trading when we first started and they, you know, took some of our courses and then they, you know, had the shiny object syndrome and wandered off and, got all kinds of emails about thousands of percent returns. And then now they've made their way back because they understand that we, uh, the way that we teach and, and, you know, actually provide realistic <laughs> teaching yeah. of, of how to trade. So this is not an infomercial for you, but it might as well be. I mean, that's the other thing that we really appreciate about you is that you're very open about your monthly guests, like trades and that, I mean, especially now working with uh, educators all the time, that's so rare and it's so refreshing. Uh, to see just someone who just says, Hey, we lost on this trade. Oh, we lost three times in a row on this trade, yeah. you know, but still showing the P and L and obviously like people make their choices because it's like, well, you, you know what you're doing. You're consistent. You're all the things that a good trader should be. And so again, just a uh, shout out to navigation because they're just very, you guys are very upfront with everything. Well, I, well, I appreciate and, and that. Also, and that, and that kind of comes from the pain that, you know, kind of like you guys talked about, you, you, you know, you always find something of value through a pain. And, and for me, it was yeah. learning from all these educators who were just full of it, right? Yes. They just didn't show you what was really going on. And so you had these unrealistic expectations. And so when I started navigation trading, that was my entire goal was like, I'm going to do it the anti way of the industry. Yes, indeed. I appreciate that. Well, that's a, to, to that point about, people being full of it. Um, there was actually another impetus for the software. 
Like we wanted to create something because we knew there was a lot of bad signals out there and bad signal services and, and just a lot of sketchy people, a lot of sharks out there in the water. And so we wanted to create a tool where someone could say, okay, let's see if this is legit, All right? Let's go back test it. They, they've been releasing a signal for the last, you know, five years. Well, you can test that, right? On SPX or SPY or the indices or whatever and see if this person's actually making the returns they say they would make, you know? If you're gonna pay and sign up for their services, mm -hmm. you can go back and look at some of the trades that they're doing. And to me, that was very that was that was a big motivation, you know, because uh, yeah, we've I've done that. I've gone down that route of someone comes and they have a newsletter and it's too good to be true, and you're like, oh, but it sounds legit. They're you know they're good at talking, and so uh, yeah, I think that's that's it's nice to give people the tools to then basically um, check the BS, so to speak. Yeah. So, so Rusty, going deep, going a little deeper into your into your trading history. So, so how when when did you start first trading, and then when did you first get into options? I think it was a little bit after Troy. Um, what's funny is I actually so I have been reading the Seam to Live quite a bit for years since essentially the crash of two thousand eight, right? The original bubble crash, and so. But I was reading more of like a philosophical level, theoretical level on markets and different things. And then <laughs> when I started deadlifting because of him, anyway, that's a whole, whole other story. Uh, but then uh, Troy got into the options part of it. He's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. This guy's talking about tail hedging and this stuff. So Troy was really interested. And he and I are pretty contrarian people, um, if that's not clear by now. And so we... <laughs> We're like, well, what's a way if everyone if, if VIX is twelve, what's you know what's a good way to hedge against that? Well, I think Troy bought VXX, and you were doing a couple other things, and and SPX put cheap SPX puts and different things, and so he did it first, and I was kind of watching. I'll never forget. I, we sat there, and you had a, a position go like I don't know sixty x hundred x with during the um, Volmageddon of what was it February twenty eighteen. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, like, just staring at your computer. And I was like, that that was how much of a position? And now it's what? And so it's kind of, like, Matt, it's kind of a terrible way to get into options. It's, but you, you see the allure. You see the asymmetry, right, which goes back to kind of the Taleb's thing. And so that kind of hooked me first, was, was finding a way to hedge my own long positions in my um, various investment accounts. And so that was my initial interest. And then... I would say more in 2020, 2021 is when we started looking at how to do it for income, how to do like repeatable, you know, SPX trading, right, with dependable, repeatable trades with high discipline instead of these once every three year, you know, asymmetrical bets. And so that's that's sort of the path that I took. And that's what started the companies that we were we were we were doing some of those income option trades and they were terrible. <laughs> so I was tired of losing money to bad strategies. And and where was your where was, where did your learning taste take place? Were you watching Tasty Trade? Did you have somebody else you were kind of following or what was your how did so you I took some of your classes. Um I took classes from Dan Sheridan. Shout out to Dan Sheridan. All, also a very honest, forthright person. Mm -hmm. Doesn't get enough respect. He's amazing. And then uh, Tasty Work stuff as well, like you're saying, watch the videos, read a lot of their, they have a lot of good documentation out there. So respect for them as well. I think those are the big three, yeah. So what was your, what was your first, do you, do you, do you have a memory of like a, a turning point in your trading mm. where, it, you know, it just kind of clicked, you had that aha light bulb moment? Yeah, so it was totally a, like a, having the right mindset thing, right? So there's a term in software development without getting too geeky and putting everyone to sleep instantly, um, where the industry pivoted before software was hosted on these very bespoke computers and servers, and people treated them like pets, right? You didn't want them to ever crash, and you had to manage all the Windows updates. But now, like Option Omega and most cloud-based services, it's on a, a whole fleet of servers out in the cloud. And if a server goes down or dies, another one pops up instantly. And so the term is cattle, not pets. So apologies to any uh, vegans in the audience. But the whole point is that like, you know, cow gets sick, you put it down and, and you eat it. And you don't, you're not, they're not your pets. You're not naming them. 
And so the same thing applies to trading, I think, right? So you're putting the trades on every day, multiple trades, hopefully, at a variety of positions. You get a sick trade, it goes against you, then you just put it, you know, you just get rid of it. It's not your pet. You don't need to name it. You're not going to get bent out of shape. It's just, it goes down and then you put the next trade on, right? It's a herd of trades that you're putting on and they're not your little babies and you shouldn't be too attached to them. So that was a big turning point for me in my trading. What about what about the flip side of that? What was a what was a big blunder? What was a big mistake that you learned a lot from? And you don't have to give dollar amounts oh. or anything like that. But any, sure, any specific sure. uh, trade that, that comes to mind? Yeah. So at one point I was doing some pretty low delta zero DTE credit spreads. Right. So for anyone who uh, hates getting gamma. This is a story for you. So it's like the end of day and you just watch it approaching your short strike all day. And you know, you have the mental, like I didn't actually have the stops. I had like emergency stops, but I had my own stops in my head that I would do. And then you talk yourself out of it. Like it'll mean revert like this level. This is like, there's market make it gamma. There's like all these reasons you have, right? There's price action. It's going to revert. So you just talk yourself out of, um, <laughs> out of that stop and then it keeps going they're like well you just double down on it you're like well it definitely this is ridiculous like the market never does this and then next thing you know you're at like a just a worse loss of your life because you had an outsized position and you were selling you know like seven delta <laughs> call credit spreads <laughs> and so the end of the day at 345 gamma is very cruel i'll just say that so then you're trying to get out of this position that's really gone against you and and it's very spready and it's just not fun for anybody. And then I just remember sitting out on my patio and this happening. I could clearly remember like even like the, the type of it was like hot and I was sweating. It was like everything was going against me that day. And I was so bent out of shape at the end of it, but only at myself because I knew I knew that I, I had the right system in place, but I chose to ignore it and chose to talk myself out of it. So that was that was probably one of my biggest blunders. It was that was a bad day. And, and and so today, what are your favorite strategies? Are you a big calendarized trade guy, zero DTE, longer duration? What's what's your what's kind of your bread and butter? I since I hate gamma uh, or getting gamma, I should say, I enjoy um, calendars of all sorts: double calendars, single calendars. I love them. There are short term, long term, middle term calendars that work, and so that's pretty. I trade probably ninety percent calendars these days. I just love them. Um, they are probably the, I think the most advanced trade out there because of the way that those different expertise work, having to know like the, the term structure of whatever underlying you're trading. And it, it's really tough to do. And I, I certainly have not mastered it, but I love the challenge of getting better and better at that because it's much, I think spreads are easy, right? Selling a credit spread is pretty straightforward, right? If it into the money, out of the money, you know, you're going to make the money or lose the money, but with a calendar, there are times you lose money. Like I have no idea why. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and you like clearly, that. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, well, I like the challenge of it. It's a whole brain kind of challenge. It's very creative, and so um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a calendar guy. And, and and so, how many on average? How many positions do you have on at any given time, typically? Oh, uh, probably between five to ten active calendars at any time. Or double That's calendars right. mostly. Yeah. Cool. Good stuff. I love it. It's, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's just, it's, I love hearing uh, people's kind of trading journey, where they came from, where they're at now, what they like to focus on, what they gravitate to. Cause it's just, it's, it's so, it's like a snowflake, right? Nobody, nobody's right. the same. Everybody's just a little bit different. <laughs> it's true. Matt, what about you? Tell us a little bit about your trading journey. Yeah. So, I mean, my background, Troy always asks everybody when we have people on our, uh, podcast he always or his cigar lounge he always asks people what their favorite greek is and my favorite greek has to be delta because my trading journey really you know i i started right before covid and made a bunch of money on puts because i was actually on um reddit quite a bit then and there was a time this, in my opinion, is not true today, where Wall Street bets actually had really good content before mm -hmm. it kind of exploded into what it is today, which is basically unusable. And there were like, I, re I, re I have texts talking to people 
in January of 2020 about COVID. Like, hey, this might this might actually be something and whatnot. And I had bought just a couple spy puts because I was brand new at trading. I didn't even know what SPX was. And I saw those spy puts go parabolic, you know? And um, I ended up, all the money I made on those puts, I ended up losing because I bought more puts. So I learned about vol crush and I started learning about Greeks the hard way. Um, the other thing I did in 2020 that really sealed the deal for me with options is in the end of the month, in March 2020, I found 20 blue chip companies, all different sectors, McDonald's, Steel Dynamics, Pfizer, like just a random assortment of companies. And I bought the longest leap I could buy on every single one of them, an even amount. Put leaps? Call leaps. Calls, Okay. So I had, I had hedged myself inadvertently because I had all these spy puts. And I remember I lost a significant amount of money, spy 212 puts. Um, and, you know, SPX got down, I don't know, 2300 maybe. I don't remember exactly. It never got down to my puts. But those calls, went. some of them went 6, 7x because I had bought leaps. I had bought some of them were 2021. Some of them were 2022 leaps. And so I saw in kind of in real time that, that unfortunately, Mr. Market is the best way to learn a lot of these lessons. So mm -hmm. in 2020, I learned some bad lessons and I also learned some good lessons. And um, up until we started Option Omega and I got super heavy into index testing, I did mostly fundamental trading. So um, I uh, was involved in meme man mania a little bit with GameStop and uh, did pretty well on GameStop. Um, not life-changing money, but nice dinner money. Like it was mm -hmm. good. So, um, and then during the bull market of 2021, I was just long a bunch of undervalued companies. And I saw like, I mean, I bought leaps on Nucor when it was $55. And it's over 150, right? You know, mm -hmm. I don't have them anymore, but I think it's over 150 now. I mean, and so you can see how powerful options are. Now, to Rusty's point, I learned about income from options instead of buying a position, waiting a long time, or YOLOing a zero DT and waiting a short time. Back testing really has helped me personally understand these trade setups. And at the end of the day, one of the lessons I feel like is the market's going to disappoint you on a short-term basis. Like whatever you think you can have, you can think about the news, you can think about gamma levels, whatever. You're going to be right some of the time, you're going to be wrong some of the time. And that's for me, that's where backtesting has been valuable because I'm trying to get less and less emotional about the positions, which is hard. It's hard for me because I come from a background of being like, hey, I'm going to, and I still, I still do a lot of single stock trading totally separate from options trading. I look at these companies, feel like they're undervalued, listen to the calls, read the filings. You get really invested in a single company. That's a totally different, that's almost not useful when you're trying to trade an option on QQQ or an SPX credit spread or whatever. And it's, it's, a, it's kind of a different mindset. And that's been something I've been really learning lately is the kind of trading that a lot of retail traders are gravitating towards with trading these very mechanical strategies that they understand very well, that's a, that's a completely different style of thinking about uh, companies and what their future is and what NVIDIA is going to do or what these, you know, minority report, Apple pro goggles or whatever impact that's going to have on the PE. That's a totally different thing. So, so like um, Rusty was saying, he doesn't name his pets. Sounds like you name your pets. I'm trying not to. <laughs> I'm trying not to. I mean, I'm still long. My biggest gainer for the year was uh, an international oil company that nobody in the U.S. trades. And the company's 4 x in the last six months. And I had the longest leaps I could have on them. And I'm out of it now. But I mean those kind of positions it's hard not to get attached it's hard mm -hmm. not to get attached when you see new core go from 
fifty dollars to one hundred thirty dollars. You know, like it's tough. Versus when you're trading an SPX calendar and you have a back test that says, okay, once my call, once my short call gets violated, or once my call side gets violated by ten points, I need to close it. And then you don't close it, and then it gets violated by fifteen points, and then twenty points, and then thirty points, and then you close it for a lot less money. That's Mr. Market teaching a lesson, and I'm right. I'm still learning lessons every day, Steve. So, <laughs> what what percentage of your trading is is kind of that longer duration leaps, individual stocks versus short duration index option trading? I think about them in t totally separate buckets. So, I have a bucket for, I have a I'm a spreadsheet person. I have a spreadsheet that has all my individual trades, and I have a totally separate tab that is my SPX trading. And most of my, all pretty much all of my back-tested trades, most of them I do on SPX. I will occasionally do a QQQ or a SPY if I want to test something, but it's nearly all SPX. So I just have them in totally separate buckets. So last year, my SPX trading carried everything else. So this year it's much more even. So <laughs> um, it's been a, it's been a you know I've heard a lot of people say this has been a very challenging environment to trade for SPX because it seems like at sometimes in the beginning part of the year the VIX was maybe a little overpriced and then you look at where the VIX is now or you know 14 15 16 VIX and every week it seems like we have a day that has a percent and a half move or you know maybe even a little more and it's like man this is tricky so some some of those positions i'm not a big condor person delta's my delta's my favorite greek thanks to gme gamma is my least favorite greek thanks to zero day condors it's it's tough out there you know and some of these some of the risk reward on these trades are are tough when you look at the interday moves so it's it's sent everybody back to the back testing table, so to speak. Yeah. I think. Yeah, as as of this recording, which is Tuesday, June sixth, I was looking at VIX on our live stream towards the end of the day, and it came down to four, the fourteen handle. Looking back on the charts, the last time that happened was pre COVID in twenty February twenty twenty. I know, and that that seems kind of wild considering some of the. I'm not a macro expert. This is not financial advice, just some guy. But you look at the world, the geopolitical situation, the financial situation, and feels a little bit low. You know, it feels, feels like maybe VIX is a little lower than it could be. And then you look at some of these interday moves, and if you have positions on that get blown out, when you have these candles from nowhere come out, or a, a trend day that just keeps going, it's, it's tough. So on your shorter shorter term trades, are you you said you're still primarily more of a delta guy? In other words, are you you're being more directional, like credit spreads? Or I I do some credit spreads. Delta is my favorite Greek, but I trade mostly calendars as well. So right calendars. now I've got okay. I can tell you I've got seven calendars on, um, and then some just some credit spreads as gotcha. well. So, um, and I you know. I, I trade them short term. I trade short term trades that I hold overnight. So there's nights when I try not to check the phone and look at what futures are doing because I've got, you know, I've got uh, trading at scale and that's part of the game um, is, you know, <laughs> managing your risk and managing how much you have on and some of these big moves. It's, it's, uh, you know, I don't want to get too deep into calendars, but I think about them. I've been taught to think of them as a tent, a double calendar. So you've got two poles and a calendar will win every time if you can get the col the poles in the right spot. So it's how wide, how narrow. And, and of course that's, that's the whole, that's the whole trick right there. Right. Very cool. Troy McNeil. Yes, sir. You're on the, you're on the hot, hot seat. So, yes, sir. I didn't realize this until we were doing a joint webinar, but you're a, you're a pastor of a church. Is that correct? I am. Yeah. Yeah. I pastored for about 10 years and 11 years. actually. So that's, uh, you know, you don't meet too many, actually, you know what, what's funny is the, the pastor of the church that I go to loves trading 
we've, we've, we've had, we've had, uh, <laughs> sessions together where he's, you know, we sit down and, and yeah. he's trying to learn he, some of the navigation trading. At well, his, probably he's probably his favorite he's, congregant. <laughs> so it's just, it's interesting. I you know, never would have thought the, the pastor and the trading thing were mixed, but that's awesome. Yeah, but, no, that's, but, that's what's funny that Dan shared in Ghost Star Church. And so it's a similar situation where uh, I have to mentally go into breakfast saying, this is not a trading session, but he loves trading. So inevitably we talk trading. But. <laughs> that's awesome. So I, I, I've heard a little bit about your your background, obviously, and, and so some of our community has as well. But tell us a little bit more about your kind of trading journey and when did you actually start trading options? Yeah, no, I think I, tra I started trading around 2018, maybe 2017, late 2017. Um, and I started almost exclusively with the idea of tail hedging and um, the worst thing happened to me and it was that like Balmageddon was like one of my first trades. And so, um, that worked out very well for me. And then I went down the route of saying options are easy. So if you're asking them like their worst trade and their favorite trade, I'm trying to like, I have a list of 50 worst trades that, you know, I keep in my backyard. Uh, I went through the pro, you know, I went through the journey. Like I've traded everything. I've traded any type of option that you can trade. I've traded it. And, that's more, it's too, you know, the good side of that would be because I like to learn and I like to try new things and I like to just breadth of knowledge is, is important to me in this industry. And so there's that, but then also I'm a, I'm a degenerate gambler. I mean, I really am. And so I just, uh, it's addicting and I love the idea of just trading in general. And so I've gone through the full gambit of stuff and it's probably around 2019, 2018, 2019, I started to shift into income trading and i i too love calendars like I, i'm kind of all in on calendars i feel like calendars give you so many so many more ways to make money than just a spread or a directional spread and so i was trying to think of, if someone asked me what my favorite group would be it'd probably be vega but you know gamma short shortly behind and so i i've done a lot of calendars last year it was like calendar mania uh, we just did calendars all the time. Uh, but I've really just, I've just done a lot of just dumb things and smart things through the years and tried it all. And, and how, how active are you? How many positions do you typically have on at any given time? We, we, we were just talking about this. I used, I mean, when I say I'm, I get addicted to trading, I, one of the things last year and co coinciding was we started this business and I would just sit in front of my screen just 18 hours a day. I mean, it was just ridiculous. Like the kids go to bed, I would trade more, you know, I would trade futures. I would do all of it. And this year I kind of had during New Year's, actually my wife and I went on vacation last towards the end of last year and sat there and had some time to think. And I was like, VIX was already in December starting to make its descent a little bit. And I think I'm perhaps the most contrary and which isn't good than the, these other two guys, but, I have just, I think I maybe were tra was trading options bef a little bit before them where I think, at least with income, Rusty, Matt, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Like, I don't think you guys have traded a 14 fix environment. You might have, I don't remember. Not, not with this kind of trades that we're doing today, no. Yeah, so I've, I've traded when VIX is 11 before. And so going into this year, I just, I, I, I really enjoy the macro trading stuff, and I've realized that just my personality, I really income trading. While I love it, it's just not my favorite. I get anxious about it. I spend too much time on it and things like that. So I've started shifting the last couple of months to really just going back to kind of my first love, which is tail hedging. And so I'm kind of right now just sitting here and working on option omega a lot thinking through trades which is fun because it's still i get to scratch my itch of thinking through trading you know what on income stuff without necessarily playing right now and so if we get down to like a 12 vix i'll probably start loading the old gun up a little bit more <laughs> but for right now i'm kind of just enjoying enjoying watching the uh, slow descent from 20 to i think it's 1395 at close so um 
Yeah, VIX to me is, I've kind of learned to just, having gone through this, this you know, 17 to 20, 2017 to 2020, like, I'm just not interested as much in playing the game at this point, partly just because I don't have to. And so I just, I, I'm back to like the research phase of my life, if that makes sense. Very cool. Well, real quick too, I, and one thing I wanted to hit on with, with each of you before we, until we can do kind of a little bit of a rapid fire round table here, but Troy, what, what, what are some of your favorite things to do outside of trading? Well, pastoring takes up a lot of my time, which I'm thankful for. Um, they were, we had a meet, we, we met again, like till like five or six Eastern yesterday. And this morning we ate breakfast and they're like, what you guys do, what you do last night? And I had to go out like 45 minutes to meet with a couple of just, that's just kind of what I do at night is I meet with a lot of people. And so I enjoy it. I love it. It's an honor to do it, but that keeps me pretty busy. And then I have two children that are autistic. So a lot of my world revolves around my house and uh, taking my son driving a lot. He loves driving. So we spend a lot of time in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Cool. Very cool. What about you, Rusty? What do you do outside of trading and programming? So, I love to do anything that doesn't involve a computer. Um, I enjoy going for hikes, walks. Uh, Troy and I have been fly fishing. He's he also likes to fly fish. He didn't say that, but um, here in East Tennessee, it's a lot of there's a lot of beautiful places to fly fish. Um, I love reading books. I'm, I'm a huge huge book nerd. Love history. So those are those are my big stitches. And then of course, spending time with my family. I have a couple teenage kids now, married. So I play a lot of board games with the kids and card games. Again, anything off the computer that I can do that is just kind of nice to balance that out because otherwise staring at a screen all day gets a little old after 20 something years. <laughs> sure. What about you, Matt? What, what passions uh, do you have outside yeah, of trading and I've programming and business? Two kids as well. So that's a lot of the time there. And then, um, I play guitar a little bit. Um, when I have time, how and, old are your uh, kids? I have a 12 and a seven. So, okay. uh, they're, at, they're both boys, both. I've been muting myself whenever I'm not talking cause they're getting ready to go to swim meet. And it sounds like a herd of elephants downstairs <laughs> and there's only two of them. So, um, but between them, I just, uh, play a little music and try to read when I have, when I have time away from option Omega or trading. Very cool. What do you, what do you do, Steve? I'm interested in, cause you, yeah. do I do for fun. <laughs> You're, you do stuff all the time with navigation. So what, what do you do for fun? Yeah. Yeah. Navigation keeps me busy, but for fun. Um, so I've got two boys as well. They're age 13 and 11. And uh, my 13 year, I coach my 13 year old's baseball team. So from nice. January 1st through the middle of July, it is baseball, baseball, baseball. Uh, every, every weekend there's a tournament. We've got practice three days a week on top of that. And so I, I, I really don't have time for much else other than yep. that. The, this year was the first year that I was kind of like, oh, man, do I want to do this again? <laughs> but he's got one more year after this, and then he's off to high school. So I, I got I to finish it. I think I'd regret it if I, if I bailed at this point. Yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah that, that pretty much consumes my life. And then uh, outside of that, I mean, we, we live on a – we've got a house that um, it sits on a property of, of almost 70 acres. And so – We've got chickens and we've got side by sides and four wheelers and and ponds and with fish in them and so we we uh, we like to hang out and and just do stuff around the house when we have when we have a minute of free time. That's is that awesome. is that Arrowhead Stadium behind you on the wall? You've got that is sure. that's the home of the Chiefs, the Super Bowl, Kansas City Chiefs. Okay, where's the best barbecue joint? Best barbecue joint in Kansas City. Best barbecue joint in Kansas City, in my humble opinion, and you'll get varying opinions yep. on this in Kansas yep. City, if you can imagine. But uh, there's a there's one called Q39. That was, that was what I was looking for. I've heard this from other people. So, <laughs> which is which is a pretty amazing because they are a fairly new barbecue place in Kansas City. And when they popped up, I was like, really another another barbecue place in Kansas City? Come on! But uh, yeah, they they quickly became my my favorite. But uh, you know, Gates and Arthur Bryant are kind of the old school famous ones. Uh, Jack Stack is a big one, but yeah, Q39 has got my nod. Write it down. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You guys ever in Kansas City, my treat, Q39. We're, All right. We're there. We, may, we may take you up on we that. We may. Yeah. I'm yeah. getting really hungry now. Well, guys, this has been awesome. I want to uh, just end it with with uh, one last thing related to Option Omega. Is there what's 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 coming with Option Omega? Is there anything? I don't want to make this a feature request kind of a conversation. Like I said, you get bombarded with those. But any anything that you want to share with with the community or the listeners about kind of where you see Option Omega going in the near future and maybe in the in the distant future as well. Well, we just came out with Apple and Tesla, which for us was a, a big move going yes, into equities, awesome. but um, feel good about that. And so that, that gives us a lot of work to do with uh, people who have never traded indexes, but they have traded, you know, liquid stocks. And so um, that'll keep us busy uh, for a while of just teaching and educating, getting people like you who trade these stocks, you know, involved in that. And so uh, that's definitely going to keep us busy. But then, you know, there's always things, on the roadmap, you know, we get asked a lot about a lot of different things all the time. So Rusty can speak to that as he's kind of our chief developer. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, there's a lot of popularity right now around zero DTE credit spreads, obviously, we all know that. And so just anything we can continue to do to support that. So looking at things like intraminute stops, because right now our resolution is one minute data, which is pretty dang good, but, um, you could certainly get even better with stops. Usually people don't want intraminute profit targets because, you know, the price will bounce all over the place. It doesn't mean you actually get filled, right? Limitation of back testing. Something, a simulation is not a live market. Um, but people do want like intraminute stops. They want um, maybe more like tranched entries. A lot of people are doing like mechanical tranched entries on things. And so we're definitely looking at like VWAP is, is a signal a lot of people use for trading. Um, difficult because SPX doesn't have volume, right? And it's a volume-based indicator. Right. So then you have to try to tie it to something, whether that's CFDs or ES or something. And then anyway, that, that one's a little bit tricky. Um, like TOS isn't supported, for example, or Tasty works out of the box. You can't see a SPX VWAP on their charting. Um, and so, but we want to try to do as many of those um, intraday and zero-day, really short-term uh, strategy support features as we can like we just did intraday emas right different like crossovers and things like that and that's been a hit so um trade re-entering throughout the day you know if you get stopped out put it on again after five minutes things like that so we'll probably continue in that direction that's where most of the requests are awesome anything else long term or anything else you want to share about where option omega is going any anything else? i mean we it's it's a huge industry right now, and we get all asked all the time about uh, could we trade these tests on a bot and things like that. And so we don't know what the future is going to hold, but we're paying attention to that and talking about it and all those things. So botting is uh, different than back testing. So uh, that would be something that would be new to us, but um, it's an exciting time in the options market. And like you said earlier, uh, retail is kind of at the forefront of all these tools right now. And so we definitely want to be a part of that. Uh, through the process. And so we're trying to think through that as well. What about, have you all had any conversations with brokers around just tying the yeah. option Omega platform into a broker? So somebody could run a pack test, say, Hey, I like this and, you know, t send it to like a tradier or, or some type of broker. Have, have you had if, those kind if, of conversations? If a broker wants to uh, reach out to us and uh, and do that, we will spend the first month in Kansas City. That's our promise <laughs> to you. We will just vacation in Kansas City afterwards. So we, we, we do think that that's probably, we are probably heading in that direction inevitably in some ways, just because brokers, we, we think we provide a valuable service. And I think brokers, from what I've seen and, and the brief interactions I've had, do as well. And so we don't know what the future is going to hold with that, but um, it's an exciting time. And then brokers themselves are kind of consolidating in some ways, you know, I know Shaw bought to you, uh, think of swim. And so who knows what it's going to look like, but that's definitely to us. It makes complete sense. You know? Cool. Well, guys, this has been great. I really appreciate your time. I know our community at Navigation Trading is has gone, you know, pretty hog wild with the uh, Option Omega backtesting tool. And so it's just been awesome to get to know you guys get to understand kind of why, 
why it is what it is and where you guys came from. I think that's pretty cool and, and, and will provide a lot of value and a lot of people will kind of help better understand kind of where, where you guys are going and why it is what it is. So that's, that's good stuff. So just, just so you know, we appreciate you keep doing what you're doing. Uh, we love, we love everything about it. We appreciate you, Steve. You, you guys have been awesome, great educator, yeah. and uh, you run a fantastic service. So uh, it's an it's an honor to get to partner with you in this way. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Hope this was helpful. Look forward to seeing you in the, in the next episode. And as always, feel free to check us out at community.navigationtrading.com. Uh, we have a a vibrant community of awesome traders always trying to help each other. So we look forward to seeing you on the inside. Cheers.